Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no holds barred. Thank you and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, back in California, this gentleman right here was a mainstay way back in the day. Charlie Kohler, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Thanks, buddy. So we got you lined up with Tim Ford, friend of the show. I think I seems to know everybody in the San Diego area. I tend yeah, not to Tim. ask any any questions in regards to relationships. <laughs> oh, Tim Ford's uh, old school. He's he was he was back in the day, and we've been good yeah. friends, and and uh, we worked together here and there, and, and uh, yeah, good great guy. He knows a lot of people. Yeah. Oh, dude, it's it's insane. Great guy. All right. Well, in the beginning, in the research that I've got, there's first off, there's not a lot about you online. Like no. there's surprisingly little. I don't know if that is set up by design or. No, I think uh, that just back in the day there was there's no iPhones or cameras. Uh so I mean a lot of a lot of my stuff is on VHS. So if it's some if you guys remember what that is, I mean it came <laughs> before the CDs, right? So uh, <laughs> or DVDs. And now, uh, now everything's everything's so access. I mean, you got so many things with with uh, every head of has a phone now, and you know, we were doing all kinds of cool stuff back in the day, and there was just not a lot of footage back there. No, 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 for sure. And one of the little side notes I found: Did you grow up in Hong Kong? Yeah, I did grow up in Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, yeah. When, yeah. When I was a uh, when I was a kid, we were living here in San Diego. And uh, we just moved to a new place in Oklahoma when I was about four or five years old. And then my dad got a, a job over in the island of Hong Kong. So we moved over there from five, when I was about five years old to about 10 years old. So okay. we lived on. Did you pick up a second language while you were there? No, I, I went to a British school. I picked up a uh, uh, British accent. So when I came back from America, I was, I was in a, I was in a school here. I was an Asian American kid with a British accent. Then uh was, was a little, <laughs> Was a little unique, to say the least. So yeah, but, is he a theater oh, kid? Yeah, is he a theater yeah, there's, kid? There's... What, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. With an attitude, right? So, right. but Hong right. Kong, there's, uh, there's two two major groups of people there that lived there at the time. There's the British, and then there's the Nationals, like the, the Chinese. And it was two different real worlds. The whole whole place was separated. Uh, I mean, we all lived together, but I had a lot of a lot of Chinese friends that went to the British school I was at. At but uh, but it was it was different from. It was, it's pretty much like San Diego and Mexico, but we lived, the, the environments were pr very similar, but we lived amongst each other. So it was, it was, it was really, really cool, cool mix. Talk about immersion. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, not too many Americans. I mean, we had a small group of Americans there, but, but they're always usually they're British or, or some other uh, European and then, uh, then the Chinese locals. Okay, so you moved back to the United States, and where does your journey in mixed martial arts begin? Well, it started in Hong Kong, actually. So oh, when I was in Hong Kong, you know, I was getting in a lot of fights at the playgrounds. Because being an Asian American kid that that didn't speak Chinese, I didn't have a lot of friends. You know, I didn't I didn't really care for the British kids; they're a little snooty, you know, at the time. And and the um, and the Chinese kids, they didn't they didn't like me because I, I had an attitude, a chip on my shoulder, and I kind of looked like them but i didn't you know and and uh, i didn't speak the language so they would always make fun of me at the playgrounds because we'd go to separate schools but then we would we'd all meet at the playground or, or the the apartment complex right there and i would get in a lot of fights with with pretty much mostly the chinese kids but both sides um uh, just uh being the only only person hanging out with myself and then trying to emerge myself into these different groups and i'd get picked on or or you know just outcast and beat up so and it was it was it was more of a game because there wasn't any sports on the island and all the playgrounds are concrete. So growing up in, in like a concrete environment, it was, we had to make our own games. And some of our games were like wrestling or fighting or war or, or little games like this. So I'd always come home with scratches on my knees or beat up. You know, this is like five, six, seven years old. And uh, we go to the playground by ourselves it's at the bottom of the apartment complex. And, and my parents were saying, this is, this is, something's wrong with you you know like you like doing this but you got you know you're always coming home with scars i just, I, I remember staying home from school 
uh, going to the school at times because I had, I had scratches on my knees and just I couldn't walk because I had scabs and I was I was just rambunctious. I was all over the place, but I was just bleeding all the place from wrestling around on the concrete. So uh, so they'd say hey, we got to, we got to put you in something. So they put me into a, a taekwondo class on the Kowloon side, which is uh, like a twenty minute walk to the bus, another 15, 15, 20 minute bus ride. And, 40 minute ferry, then another another 30 minute walk to the to the YMCA on the Kowloon side off the island. And I went there two, three days a week and found a great instructor to teach Taekwondo. And and uh and that's where I got my my martial arts start. Okay. Okay, cool, cool. So you also like in your fight style, you also had a pretty good wrestling pedigree. Yeah. Where does that where does that come into play? Well, I wrestled. We had a lot of good wrestlers uh, that came in when we started teaching at at a Sunrise Church. We had an outreach program. We came back and and just wrestling from from just so many different coaches coming in. We had a lot of great guys come in. The late late uh, Jeff Hine and and guys that that worked with really really good wrestlers growing up and and a good East County and San Diego County uh, delegate of wrestlers would come by and we would teach and they would teach us and and. Uh, I mean, Javi Vasquez from uh, up in uh, up in uh, Grand Cucamonga area, and she worked with some of the guys here and there. But just nonstop training wrestling. I never wrestled in in, um, in high school as a sport, but I really took it on. I tried to wrestle. My high school didn't have wrestling, so I'd go down to the Grand Hills High School or some other other high schools and, and mess around with the guys down there and just learn some moves. And uh, never really got into the sport, but got into the takedowns, got into the dominance, and and uh, and kind of the posing your will and the style and the relentlessness of, of a lot of my friends that taught me and uh and just drilling drilling into our knees bled i mean we'd shoot up and down the mats after jiu-jitsu practice four or five hundred times and we'd bleed through our uh our uh, neoprene regards and we say okay that's that's about time to uh, call it quits we heal up and then do it again the next week okay so in essence you didn't have a traditional high school wrestling program that you went through no, not not a uh, not okay. No. Okay, I, I I will say stylistically, based on like watching your fights. Of, I mean, I've watched most of them. I would call you a liar right now, based on yeah. how good your takedowns were, like in your hips and your takedowns. I mean, there's a couple times where I was surprised. Like I thought, like man, you know, he's got real high level wrestling, like Vitor Shalin. I mean, obviously, we'll get to that fight. I was really surprised that you didn't have like hip dominance on him. But it's pretty shocking how good your takedowns are, com- considering you didn't wrestle in high school. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, we just a lot of training, and uh, I, I attribute it to mostly football. I mean, we're playing football, and just uh, the mentality of putting your head down and and going through somebody. And now you can't do that. You can't say that. You can't coach that to the kids. But uh, but I mean, to do it properly, you need to get low, you know, change your level level and put your head through somebody. And uh, now it's like okay, you, can't, you can't lead with the head. I mean, it's just, there's all all kinds of language, but bottom line is when you're when you're wrestling or tackling somebody you're gonna lead with your head whether you like it or not you gotta be able to it's put just, your head it, it, yeah it's just where your head touches you know yeah, try to make it go to the side of the leg or you know maybe exactly. in the chest right right, right. Sure. sure yeah and then and when we were growing up in pop warner or high school football we didn't we it was like put your head through them the helmet wasn't <laughs> a what it wasn't it wasn't uh it wasn't there to protect your head it was there to, as a weapon. a weapon it was a weapon yeah. all right let's, we used let's, it. We, it's right right use it to hurt somebody right. oh yeah we i mean we tried i mean yeah. you, got, you got a couple pound weapon on your head and you got rock head you got knuckle you got rocks in here you're going to use it as much as you can to uh to try to dominate let's start with the plugs let's let's get going but you've got a gym in san diego would you mind uh, yeah. it's called san diego fight club we just moved over to uh to uh a uh, new location it's uh 1301 pepper drive it's in El Cajon. and everybody's welcome come on in we'd have a nice open mat on uh on different days there so come check in with us you can look us up on uh on facebook or instagram san diego fight club or or you could go over to my name charlie kohler and uh, we'll hook you up with a with a free pass. Check, come check out the gym and and I get some work in. Okay, your first day of jujitsu. Where are you at? First day of jujitsu. Well, growing up, like I said, doing martial arts, and I, I and uh, when I came back to Hong uh, from Hong Kong to here, I met a good group of guys, and uh, there's a mentor of mine. They did martial arts, and we'll talk more about them. But uh, but he went up going up to, in San Diego, went up to a jujitsu place. Uh, actually a garage 
with Nelson Montero. And he was a first jiu-jitsu uh, practitioner in, in San Diego. This was back in the early 90s, I think 91, 92-ish, 91. And he'd come back, and and we're all into kite kickboxing, you should, uh, uh, Muay Thai at the time, boxing, like just some. And we'd always have to be in a stick fighting and and um, and pin a lot and and I cut, scream at my colleague. But he came back and said, "Check these guys out, these crazy guys." And we saw the films of them. And we're like, "Ah, I don't know, I don't know about this." And we'd lay on their backs, and we, we would just do this and that to them, just like everybody else saw it, right? Yeah. When uh, we saw a hoist first fight, right? And we're kids. We're probably 16, 17 years old. And so Dr. Pittman was was one of our, my mentor's names. He'd come in and throw some some stuff on the ground, right? Man, this stuff is this stuff is pretty good. You know, it's just this is unique. Excuse me. So after he trained for maybe two, three months, took private lessons from Nelson. So he had one up on us. He'd show us these really cool moves. And then he then he finally we invited he invited us up to uh where he trained, which is up in Encinitas. And Nelson Montero is now he's part of he's Gracie Baja. From the beginning, but, but, but he, uh, so, he that garage. so you dabbled in jujitsu pre UFC one. Oh yeah, yeah. We were. Uh, we remember. Uh, remember watching Hoist fight. We were nervous for him. We we're like, oh my goodness, man. We don't know about this one. You know what I mean? Like, I know this stuff really works, but look at the monsters he's going against. But right? Does it? So, does, yeah, I, does it? Does it? Yeah. We, we yeah. knew Hoist was was an amazing. Amazing practitioner, but we didn't know how big of a fighter he was in a sense, you know. I mean, okay. we knew if you threw... Wait, I, I apologize. Did you do privates with Hoist pre UFC no. one? No, I didn't. Uh, we didn't. We didn't do any any privates with Hoist, but uh, with uh, Fabio Santos and Nelson uh, Montero, and then and there's a couple other guys that came into our garage and helped us before they had studios up in San Diego. What about uh, Eric Paulson? Did you ever cross paths with Eric Paulson pre UFC one? No, I never, I never trained with Eric, but uh, but he trained under I think uh, Dan and Santos and Richard B. Steele. I'm not sure, but I remember when I was a kid, Richard B. Steele and Dan and Santos came to San Diego and they trained with us, and uh, and yeah, we were, we were young. It was it was more Kali and Escrima, but it was great, and we did. Day, days with them, six, seven hour seminars. It was it was amazing. And we were younger, but, uh, but Eric Paulson, no, uh, we ran into each other during the MMA scene. Really cool guy, a lot of respect for him, you know, and he's got a wealth of knowledge, but uh, never worked with him uh, uh, individually. Okay, so when in our interview with Eric Paulson, essentially he was doing privates with Hoist and Hickson almost a decade before UFC won. Like he's, He's a guy that's addicted to learning and learning. And when we asked him, privates with Hoyce, privates with Hickson, privates with Danny Inosanto, who was the person that had like the most, you learned the most from, or the person that really just allowed you to grow up to grow? He said, Danny Inosanto, no question. Oh, by was far. Really? Yeah, I remember when, when we were going, I think we we're maybe 12 years old, 13 years old at the time. And uh, he came into the class, and he was Richard was down. He was Richard's seminar, and uh, and there was all it's an adult class, but we were young. We we're probably man, it was down at the Naval Training Center. There was probably about 15, 20 of us, and and maybe six of us were kids. And we're talking shoot, yeah, 12, 13 years old, maybe. And just the way they taught and their demeanor. I mean, I haven't taught, I haven't learned with Hoist or Hickson. I'm sure, I'm sure they have very similar, but Dan and Santos is such a wealth of knowledge. And then, you know, when you teach that long and so many different varieties of martial arts and so many different disciplines, you you learn there's so many different people and how they learn and how they adapt to what you're teaching them. So it's uh so you could and and also the history and, and the whole thing behind it. I mean, he 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 brought that vibe to the to learning and where you wanted to be a part of it. Okay. So you're dabbling in jujitsu started pre UFC one, which is pretty incredible. Like it's that in itself is you, you're probably one of you know, under a hundred people in the United States. that can say that. <laughs> right. So yeah, well, with, with, with Nelson in the garage, man, we'd go up there and uh, he was training out of his one car garage up in Encinitas. He just moved to uh, San Diego from Brazil. Maybe maybe a year before that. And, and how uh, does he recruit his people then? I don't know, man. And, uh, Dr. Pittman, like I said, our, our our mentor that set up all these seminars, and and he's a he's like a father figure to me. And uh, I was I was 
family friends with them and, and the and the boys had three brothers, um, Mike, Oli, and Ben, and we were just like cousins. We're family. I, I spent a lot of time in their house since I was ten, and 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 Dr. Pittman had a wealth of knowledge. He knew all these guys. He knew Dan and Santos. He knew. Richard B. Steele, he, he trained with Chuck Norris up in L.A. back in the day, and he found out about these Gracies before, and in, in, in when the when the in-action Gracie fights came, and the black and white footages, he had footages of those on v, v, uh, VHSs, and we'd watch them, and we're like, what is this going on here, man? What kind of fighting is this? And he explained to us that there's a $100,000 challenge if you could beat these guys, and you'd get it. It was, it was way back in the day, and we're like, man, these guys fight weird, but and nobody seems to beat him. So so he's shown us this stuff, and then he ends up going learning about it, and then come back and showing us some stuff. And then that's when we went up, he sent us up to Nelson's garage. He said, you guys are ready. You guys have about a week worth of, uh, two weeks worth of jiu-jitsu in, maybe a month of jiu-jitsu in, because he was showing us that, that in the side of the garage. He's like, well, there you go. We're going to, we said, we said there's like five of us, six of us in a car saying, well, let's go up there. Let's, let's not tap. Let's not tap to anybody, you know? And we're all white belts, and we're all athletes. We're, you are we're probably in college at the time, and Nelson lined up seven of us in a row and just went through each of us two or three times each. Had a smile on his face, barely, barely broke a sweat, and we're like, "Man, this is legit. We gotta, we need more of this." So just, that's how it all well, started. It, it, it's either one of two things: either you need more of it, or you leave going, "Yeah, I don't want to talk about that again. Let's just keep doing what we were doing." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I was talking, either, either you're going to be in denial or you're going to be humble. Right. Uh, for for young kids that are that are you know full of testosterone 17 we're in college just graduated high school it's like man it's it's a humble pill to swallow and uh when when somebody does it to you that's so nice and does it in such a such a fluid way i mean it was it was it was it was something like hey this is somebody i need to follow this is something i need to be a part of Right, right. So on June eighth, nineteen ninety eight, Cobra Fighting Federation, you make your MMA debut. Is there any fights prior to that? Uh, I think I fought for Cobra a few few times. I'm not sure if it's uh that was ninety eight. Yeah, a lot that times like the record keeping around this time really wasn't the best. Yeah, there's there's not much um there's not much of the the foot there's no footage as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was that one or one maybe one before. Um, it was yep up in the Cobra Cobra Challenge uh, days. Okay, so from what I understand, the Cobra Fighting Federation Mark Hall, it, it's yep. his, uh, it was kind of like the Wild West, pulling people out of the audience, you know, settling street beefs. Yeah, they, they, I'm sure they did, but the ones I fought in, they were they're all pretty legitimate fighters. I mean, the, the guys were fighting. I mean, I brought a crew because I didn't know anything about the, the fight game, and there was no fight game back in the day. And it wasn't called mixed martial arts. It was called NHB. Yeah. There was no one barred for, for the guys that nope, didn't know that. And, and um, a few of the fights, it was it was bare knuckles, and we would just go. And and I told guys, I told Mark back in the day, I'm like, you know, I, I trust Mark. I didn't know, I, you know, I know him now, but I didn't know him back then. And I'd say, say, tell him, hey, I want to fight first because – if this doesn't go right, doesn't go right. I got fifty friends here. We're throwing chairs, and we burn this place. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, the audience like, and the audience isn't here yet. I can leave. Right? <laughs> yeah, we can leave, and the show's not going to go. That's just how it's going to go. Because you know, if you're going to switch opponents on me or, or set me up somehow, it's like I don't know. You know, at the time we didn't know anything about it. There's no, there's no fight game. And Mark seemed like a good guy, but you just don't know what's going to happen, right? So, so I brought a bunch of guys. We fought first. It was the main event, but we fought first. <laughs> And uh, and uh, yeah, end up fighting a um, a pretty tough guy, bare knuckles. Uh, that one was, I think, at the last as the last minute, they changed the rules in the fight to make it go off. It was in a huge bar in San Diego and in, uh, in Temecula, which was at the time was the largest bar in San Diego and in California. It was like an old Home Depot, and they put a bar in there and with a bull ring and a in the ring. And it was huge. I mean, it, it, you could pack thousands of people in there. We probably had uh, four or five hundred people there watching this. And so, uh, was when you fought John McPherson. That was June eighth, nineteen ninety eight. Was that the yeah, first? Co- uh, was it? Was that the first one he ever did? I think that might have been second one, first or second. Does it sound okay. like he had it before? And uh, John McPherson. Yeah, he. Weird story. They said. Uh, 
they said, hey, hey, do a number on this guy, right? And then they said, you got to change the rules. You can't punch this guy. You can only hit him with open palms, which was, at the time, was was a little weird because we never trained with open palms. We're not doing doing this kind of fighting, you know? We're, we're used to treating knuckles. So I ended up just slapping this guy a bunch of times and then took him down. And I remember this guy had my back. I mean, I had his back, and he reached back and cupped my ear with the open palm and blew my eardrum out. And I'm like, son of a bitch. So I started hitting him with my open palm facing inward, which is probably a better way to hit somebody when you're on their back, when you're choking them. Hit them inward with your palm instead of the knuckles. A little bit easier to do. So he got bladed up a little bit. and uh, But yeah, it was pretty brutal. I think I think I made a few hundred bucks for the fight and I went up to the bar tab and, and then my broken eardrum blew cost me six. <laughs> <laughs> blew it. You blew everything, right? Now, yeah, right? I think Scott Adams was on that card as well. I yeah, always, some, yeah. yeah. There were some. There's some. There's some uh, fights. And Scott Adams, and there's some couple other guys, and there's some old school jujitsu guys up in Rancho Cucamonga area, Temecula, LA areas that come down. But I remember uh, uh, Mark had a fight. It was probably a couple of years after I was supposed to fight. I fought a few times from after that, but the one fight I was supposed to fight were the main event. And I was supposed to fight against Shannon, Shannon Rich. And I'm like, hey, is this guy going to show up? And he's like, no, this guy never misses a fight. He was, I was supposed to be, he was supposed to have 100 fights at the time. And I only had a couple, maybe four or five. And then he didn't show up. So then they start pulling people out of the crowd. And, and I'm like, and I'm looking at this. And this guy's, one guy's drunk. One guy's just, just, I'm like, I'm not fighting these guys. And then Chuck Liddell came up and said, hey, Charlie, uh, you want to fight this kid? He's he's pretty good, you know. He hasn't fought before, but he's really good. And I'm like checking him out, and his name is Jake Shields. He's an all American, uh, all American uh, uh, junior college wrestler. So I'm like, okay, he was young at the time. I was young too. I'm like, that's this is gonna be a good fight. And I'm looking at the drunk guys. I'm looking at Jake. I'm looking at these guys. And my manager, and it's getting late. The crowd starts getting wild. They start almost having a riot. And we're like, no, nah, this is not. This is just not gonna work out, you know. I mean. We didn't prepare for this guy. We didn't prepare to fight a, for a drunk idiot either. I mean, we, we want <laughs> Shannon. And so we waited for him a little bit more, and then it just didn't work out. We just didn't fight. And and uh, and I think they might have started a little riot at the time because they're waiting for the main event to go off, and it never went off. So um, I, I have heard it's people with belt buckles fighting each other. Like, they say Cobra fighting was just I, – I got – no. There wasn't a lot of oversight. <laughs> no, I, I mean you. Were, that's why I wanted to fight first. That was the only fight that they still me last. I told them, "Listen, from now on, I want to fight first because I want to get my money and get out of there. And if something happens, like in between, like halftime, and there's a riot, then the cops come and the helicopters come. I'm not gonna be able to fight. I got a hundred people here watching me. I'm gonna beat somebody up, you know. So, right, so right. I, I want to waste it. So I want to fight first. And then I remember on that fight, I went out to the the ring, which they cover. Cobra Challenge, they had, at that time, they had a white ring. It was a boxing ring, but the canvas was white. I'd go out there maybe five fights in to check out the ring during the intermission, and the place was, like, red. It was a, it was pink and red. It looked like someone took some white, I mean, uh, some red paint and just splattered it all over the, all over the place. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be grappling on this stuff? There's, like, chunks of, of stuff on this mat. And... And so from then on, I'm like, no, nah, I'm fine first. I'm getting my penicillin shot, a couple of head and that shot too, because bare knuckles, it's uh, you're going to get bloody even if you win. No, for sure. So by the time your first fight came around, what belt were you? It was a purple belt. Really? Yeah. I was okay. a purple belt, and then uh, and I went to, I, I actually spent time in Abu Dhabi, lived there for a while. Yeah, but I it's... think it was. There you go, February 24th, 1999. You're at Abu Dhabi, the second Abu Dhabi. Were you living there? I was staying with, uh, that time I was staying with uh, one of our teammates, Sean Alvarez. So oh, I, Sean Alvarez, with, he made it to the finals. Yeah, he he won, I think, uh, the first year. Uh-huh. Or he might have lost to Rico Rodriguez. And then uh, second year, second or third year, he he won. One of one of the years, he, he won it all. And then... Uh, yeah, I was staying with Sean for a little bit, but we stayed with Nelson there uh, prior to that, back in 95, in Abu Dhabi. We lived there for about three or four months, three months before the first Mundial was in uh, Brazil, down in uh, Rio de Janeiro for the first 
they had World War Championships, but it was just Brazilians back in the day. And this was the first one where they had Americans, the Japanese, and some Europeans come. It was the first real World Championships that Brazil held. So were you there when the Penn brothers entered? Uh, BJ and those guys? Yeah, it was BJ, yeah. No, I think they came up, they, they were a couple of years after. I mean, they must have been later, later 90s. Yeah, we're there in 96, 95, 96 in Brazil. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was the very first moon GLs. Uh, yeah, they, well, what happened was Nelson uh, was, was friends with Carlos Gracie Jr., which is his instructor and, and the main Baja instructor, right? And so <clears throat> Nelson goes over to Abu Dhabi because he, uh, the Sheik, Sheik, the great Sheik Taknoon, he Taknun, was uh, yeah. one of the one of the one of the guys that came and trained, and he took Nelson uh, to Abu Dhabi to help train him for months. And Nelson had this idea. He called Carlos Gracie Jr. and said, "Let's do a, a real world championship. We'll call the Machado Brothers up in LA. We'll get a team. We'll get Team USA through then. We'll get the Japanese guys coming down, some judo guys and some uh, jiu-jitsu guys. And then we're going to need a couple more countries. So Nelson's like, "Well, let's fly a bunch of guys out of my school to Abu Dhabi." We'll they'll live in, and train here for three months. We'll represent Abu Dhabi. There, there's seven of us, Abu Dhabi seven, and then we we compete in the World Championships as the Abu Dhabi team. So there'd be an extra country there. So so Nelson uh, and Sheikh Taknoon, he he flew uh, seven, six six seven of us out there because I think Sean was already out there, and and we we stayed there and and lived and <clears throat> was an amazing experience. Um, wait, did, okay did you guys get a salary for living there or was it just amenities and food they got they gave us a little bit of both they gave us a little bit of both or and and everything was handled so we didn't have to pay for anything and on the way out they they gave us a little salary holy cow so in 1999 you go up against eddie ruiz one of tank abbott's buddies yeah. Uh, kind yep. of a uh, a Huntington Beach menace. Yep. Yeah, I wish uh, I wish that match would have been better. Uh, before that match, I was we're training in in at our at our at our church the uh, outreach where we had, and a lot of guys come in and and help train. And uh, I remember Townsend Sanders. He came in right before Townsend Sanders, the silver medalist. He fought in the oh, UFC. Of course, yeah. Mike, Mike and some guys, right? He fought and Pat. He town. fought yep. Townsend Sanders. Fought Pat Militich. I think he had to go into overtime. Militich barely eked him out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was a really tough fight. He came in, and and I already I already uh, I separated a bunch of ribs continuously for that whole year. So every time I trained, I couldn't. That I would take a month off, and then the day I come back, my ribs would separate. Then I'd take two months off. The day I come back, my ribs would separate again. So it happened all year long, where I was taking three months off. And then my ribs separated like three weeks before. And then they said, Townsend Sanders, this kid, the Olympians coming in to the church. And I'm like, well, I got to train with this guy, you know? And, but they're like, you got Abu Dhabi coming up in about a month. I'm like, well, it's okay. You know, let's go. So I was going with them and we wrestled and man, they got strong, great, incredible athlete. And that was right before he fought. I think he fought uh, Gio Tadao. It was, it was like. Gio Tadao. Before. Yeah. 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 The uh, Luda Libre guy. Before. Three weeks before he's fighting him, so we're we're getting some pretty good work in. And I had him in uh, in my guard, and he folded my legs over, and my ribs popped again. And but I continued, and we trained the next day a little bit. We did some stand up the next day. Uh, incredible athlete, good guy. But I was going, and then Abu Dhabi for me was like a month after that. So I was going into it with a uh, with uh, some uh. bad ribs, and I didn't have a lot of training getting into it because every time I touched the mat, my ribs would just they'd fold over. So I was going against Eddie, and he's in my guard, half you know, maybe five minutes in, and then we had this snap, this pop, and he froze, and he looked at me, and I looked at him. I'm on the bottom looking up, and he said, "Was that you or was that me?" And I said, "I think it's me, bro. Don't worry. Let's keep going." So we kept going. So five minutes in, no, it was like it was it was like two minutes, two three minutes in. So for eight more minutes, I was wrestling with a with a with a separated rib. And he couldn't pass my guard, but they gave him the decision because he was he was on top. I think it was zero zero. And uh they gave him the decision he's on top. Well, actually, no, they went we went no, we we went to overtime. We tried to go overtime and they said do a push-up. And I couldn't do really a good push-up without wincing. And they called the called it off and they gave him the decision. 
you know. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> the, the rules back then. Oh, well, there's yeah. the push-up rule. I don't know if you read the subsection, you know, about how to, yeah. how to yeah. win. Yeah, I'm like, 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 <laughs> I'm like, I don't get to do push-up. I mean, I'm going to be on my back because I'm not taking this guy down right now because I can't even lift. I can barely stand up straight. So, so, uh, so I figure I'm gonna I'm gonna submit this guy from my back, and they said do a push up and move around, and and I'm listening. I'm good to go. I'm good to go. I mean, I did just did eight minutes with him with a busted rib, and they said no, it's no good. And then they gave him the win. What? Hey, you know what? He's on top the whole time, and that's how the rules are. You know, it, it looked it, like. And let's like further it. He beat Hobbin Gracie right after. Yeah, that. the next round he beat Hobbin, which I'm like, damn, I could have gone against Hobbin because I know because Eddie's a tough guy, but. I mean, with the busted rib, and you can't you can't do anything to me. I mean, come on, you know. Like if I'm a little healthier, I'm uh, I'm thinking it's going to be a little bit different. But but hey, he he stuck it out. He won. He beat Hobbin, and then he lost to I think uh, Sato. Yeah, he took fourth. He took fourth. And, and yeah, he took fourth place, which was pretty amazing. It was I was like, wow, good for him. <laughs> good for him. A wrestler that didn't know much, he went in there and, and dominated pretty well. Uh, fourth he, place. He, I think there was he would may have been a second American to beat a Gracie. I don't think he, he was definitely not the first. Somebody beat one in '96. It's I'll, it'll, it'll come to me. Um, okay, so in Abu Dhabi, it was the beginning of what obviously has become just an incredible, uh, incredible organization. Who yeah. you, who was your, who was your roommate? Well, we well we stayed with Nelson, and we stayed at he had his penthouse there in Abu Dhabi. And we stayed with him. There was. There was, we had Micah Pittman, we had uh, Curtis, um, Peter Posh, shoot, uh, man, we had a so, couple of so guys. Yeah, you guys were already set up then. Okay. Yeah, we were already set up. We are all on the same team. We had Chris Corrales. We had a bunch of us who were good blue belts. And we've been blue belts for years. And then uh, we went over there and we trained with Nelson. And, and while we were there, we met Sean. But we... But Sean was about 265 pounds at the time. He was like a bodybuilder. He was he was training shit talk noon and uh fitness and bodybuilding. Or not bodybuilding, just the same shit. He was his personal personal uh, uh workout uh partner and, and teacher. So he and Sean was really uh, there with Nelson for about three months, just two or three and months. Sh- and Sean Alvarez, their relationship goes back to college. Am I correct? Yeah, San Diego. Yep, San Diego. Uh from from what I know, talk. She talked to me, went to UCSD or went to the, one of the colleges around and, and uh, they met in, around that time up in La Jolla and uh, Sean was, that's, was that's amazing. Of him. Yeah. And then, and then she talked to him and took, uh, took Sean back to Abu Dhabi as a, as a trainer and a friend. And, and then when you were there, yeah, Sean and Nelson became friends because there's not a lot back in the day. This is what, 25, 26. No, this is yeah, 26, 27 years ago. There was, there was, the Abu Dhabi is a lot different. It was beautiful, but it was very, there wasn't much there. There's buildings and stuff, but it wasn't much. I mean, if you found another American, you'd, you'd be very surprised to find another American there that, that had your same interests. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, yeah. It's pretty and, incredible. Uh, and Sean and Sean and Nelson just being two athletic guys and, and into the same industry, they, they started, uh, start training together. Nelson trained, uh, Sean and Jiu Jitsu and Sean trained Nelson and, and some, and some weights. And by the time we got there, Sean was pretty well versed. But being 200, 270 pounds, two hundred sixty-five pounds, bodybuilding, big dude, big hairy guy. We got to Abu Dhabi. I remember the first time we trained. Uh, we're all on the mat, and when she talked to him, it's a little palace, it's, it's a little villas, and uh, we're training. And the whole mat, the whole time, Sean didn't say anything. And we look at him; he had a beard. He's dark because it's so it the weather there was so. I mean, it's sun all day long, and. We're thinking, man, this is a this is a, one of the biggest Arabs I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> this guy's <laughs> there, right. I mean, this guy is man, looks like looks like a pretty you know, we he was a body uh bodybuilder, but we thought he's a bodyguard as well, you know, if it, he fits the, the mold. So we're saying to each other, like, let's get this guy We're on the mat. It's a small room. It was probably about as about as big as a maybe a little bit bigger than a two-car garage. And uh hey, a little bit bigger than that. And we're we're sitting there talking, and some guys went with him. He had a white belt on. Because he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he didn't level up yet. And Nelson did, did just, Nelson wasn't big on, big on belts back then. We just, it wasn't like, like, it was a big deal for all of us, really. We didn't really care about it. And Nelson, uh, I mean, I'm sure Sean, Sean was a blue belt level or even higher, but 
he's had a white belt on. Like, let's get this big guy, man. Let's get him. We're just, just, we can't, we can't lose with him. We're from San Diego. We've been trained for years. You know, we're, we're these kids <laughs> we're going on and we're trying to arm bar him. And he's just picking people up in the arm bar and just slamming them down. Look like a cartoon. Boom, boom, boom. And right. And we're all about 160 pounds at the time. 160, 65. The, the lightest from 142s and the heaviest are like 167. And Sean was good 100 pounds more than all of us. And he just try to choke him. He just throws us off like, like you ever see those like little jackals or, or, the, or the lions trying to attack an elephant. It was like, just getting flung off left and right. And we're like, come on, man, let's let's go. So we can beat this. We're going. We're talking shit to him. We're like, come on, man. It's like, just like get this guy. Man. We have to get this gorilla. So we got to beat him. <laughs> At the end of training, he looks over to us. He's like, yo, you guys quit talking shit. And we're like, what? We're like, what? We thought we didn't know you spoke English, man. He's like, yo, man, I'm from New York. <laughs> we're like, oh shit! We thought you were from uh, from from over here. We thought you were you're Arab and you didn't know English. He didn't say anything the whole time. And we're hilarious. Like, oh. That's we hilarious. Whole time, yeah. And uh, then we became good friends. And yeah, he he was from New York, but Puerto Rican from New York. But he he grew up in uh, I mean, he he lived and trained out in San Diego, so we had the same roots with the, some of the you know some same places. And that was it. So Nelson Montero, so. Was he friends with the Sheik right around with Henzo, or was he pre Henzo? Yeah, it was pre Henzo. Holy shit. shit! Yeah, I just saw I just saw Penzo down at the last uh, ADCC, and uh, I, I we ran into each other, and I looked at him. He looked at me. He didn't know what I was thinking. We hadn't seen each other for years because he trained us down in Graha Bagri. So I've seen him, you know, seen him here and there at different events since then, but. Uh, but we looked at each other and we locked eyes and said, okay, ah, and then we recognized, he recognized me and I said, and he took me around saying, hey, this guy was in Abu Dhabi before I was. He's showing all his friends, like he was there with Nelson and Sean, these guys, he, and he kept saying that. And I'm like, hey, Henzo, you're there in the beginning too, man. It wasn't just us, but yeah, we were there. <laughs> yeah, for, I got you by a few months. <laughs> I got you by a few months, you know? <laughs> yeah, but the funny story about the Abu Dhabi tournament, okay, right before we went down to Brazil for the Mugiels, right, for the, the, the Gi tournament, when we're all in Abu Dhabi, we're then there for two and a half, three months training, two days a week. I mean, there's not much to do there. I mean, if you think about like the real world or the, uh, the UFC house, that was like the real UFC house. I mean, that was the real version. We all lived in one house. We didn't have communications with anything because we, we called home maybe once a week because it was so expensive back to US, the United States. It's a 12 hour difference. So we barely, we wrote letters and postcards to our family back home. That's how long ago it was. So, and then, and then the, there was no cable TV, so we watched v, VHS tapes, okay, or the local news. There wasn't much going on. So think about all of us in one house, uh, getting ready for these matches in a foreign land, which is beautiful at the time. I mean, it still is. And man, you get all these personalities in one place, and there was there's not much to do but train and to talk shit and just kind of fight amongst ourselves a little bit and play jokes on each other, you know, but. But before that, uh, we so we trained a couple days a week, I mean, a couple days, a couple times a day, every day, pretty much every day. And uh, we didn't want to take a day off because we're, what we're going to do, lay around? We didn't, you know, so we trained even on our days off. We probably had one or two days off uh, every two weeks. We trained even on those days because we're just so bored uh, from what else. I mean, we didn't take advantage of the place. We, there's beaches and some nice stuff, but we just, we got to stay indoors and, we went around, but there wasn't a lot going on. It's like being in Disneyland by yourself. I mean, it's always fun with a lot more friends, you know what I'm saying? But if you go to Disneyland by yourself and, and everything's handled, everything's free, there's no lines. I mean, the no lines thing's kind of nice, but it's kind of like, okay, you get, there's so much to do. There's like, you don't do anything. You just, you know, you just walk around and it was like a paradise. Wow. And we had the personal chefs bring us food and uh, just accommodations were nice. And and everything was handled. We never never had to pay for anything. We didn't have anything anyways. We're college kids at the time, and uh, a couple of our guys were going into med school, and they they put that on hold. And I was going into uh, I was at UCSD, and I put that on hold. And and so we had we had things going on. And so, as soon as we got there, we're just training and and just kind of soaking up everything. But after a week or two, it was like man, all we did was train at the time because there wasn't a lot. And right before we left to go to back home. Uh, we're gonna stay at home for about two weeks, and we're gonna travel down to Rio de Janeiro for the for the for the championships. Uh, talk, Chick Talk Noon said uh, he gave Nelson the notice and told everybody, "Say, hey, any 
sprung this on us. He said, tomorrow we're going to do a tournament. We're going we're gonna to go no time limit and every submission counts and no points. And I want to see who wins, who wins a team tournament. And there is eight of us on the team. So you had to win three matches, kind of like the old UFC, three, boom, 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 and tear it down. And excuse me, and no time limits and no no points. So it was all submission with the D's on. So uh so all this little guys we got around and we're like, okay, we gotta make sure that we have two big guys on team, Ted Circle and then and then Sean Alvarez. And we're like, we can't let these big guys beat us. You know, there's six of us little guys. We represent everybody under like 160, 165. And these guys are 250, 265, right? <laughs> Whatever happens, we cannot let these guys beat us, you know, because we're we're younger, we're the we're the more athletic guys, and and uh we're not gonna let these these older, bigger dudes beat us. So we try to make a plan like, okay, if we get matched up, okay, I could beat so-and-so, you could beat me, I could beat this and that. So how are we gonna do this so that so that there's no time limits. We're going to beat the shit out of each other. And then we get to the finals against one of these monsters and they're going to run us over, you know? So how are we going to, how are we going to set this up? And we're arguing who could go forward and how, you know, not, not to, uh, not, not to, uh, um, uh, not to try to choreograph it, but just try to say, okay, well, we're going to go fast and, and this, this is how far we're going to go on each other. Or we're going to go slow so we can conserve energy and just play the jiu-jitsu game with each other, right? So, so we're getting up arguing about it, and then nobody nobody can come to agreement. And then we said, okay, let's just do it legit. Let's just do it legit. Every just goes, everybody has their own strategy, their own mindset. And this is just a, us six the little guys talking away from the big guys. You know, because we, we had to make sure that one of them weren't going to win. But... But we knew we're gonna get we're gonna damage each other on the way to the finals. So so saying like, okay, well my arms hurt, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, don't take this arm to this one. And everybody started complaining about stuff and trying to negotiate. And we just said, you know, let's screw that. Let's just do it legit. Let's just go after each other. Whatever happens, happens. Okay. If one of those big guys wins, so be it. You know? So we went in and uh and we had matches where my first two guys, Chris, I think I submitted him pretty fast. It was uh, I was I was a little bit bigger. I was bigger than Peter and and Chris. By about okay, and let, let's let's use their last names so everybody you know that the dorks at home could follow with this. What, what, uh, their last names? Yes. Um, yeah, Chris Corrales and uh, and Peter Posh. Okay. 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 And um, so I went through each of them pretty fast within within two minutes, and oh. and yeah, I was I was a little bit bigger than them. Chris was like in the forties. Peter was in the fifties and I was in the sixties. So we had we're three different tiers. I got matched up with them and and I figured if I don't get take them out fast and I go four, five, six, ten minutes with them, my next match, I'm gonna be a little bit more exhausted. So if I don't go after them and shoot a bullet real fast on them and miss, uh, if I miss, if I might win, I might not win, but if I win, I'm gonna be exhausted. So it's gonna be death in the next match, anyways. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go after him. Just, just go be aggressive. So I went after him both and got them both within, within two minutes, maybe two and a half minutes. Okay, so I'm in the finals. My other teammate Micah, he's probably the most most talented one out of all of us. He had the most experience and and very very good jujitsu, uh, probably the highest level. You know, he went through Ted, which is a 100, 250 pound dude, and he had like a 17 minute match with him, right? And Ted was throwing around, and finally Ted, he just he just couldn't. I mean, Micah, Micah got him. Micah was pretty exhausted. And then he had to go against Sean. That was the bracket he was in. He has a 24-minute match with Sean after he just went like 17 minutes with Ted. And Sean is just he's 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 no, he's not a party to go with. I mean, you go with him, you're gonna get beat up even. I mean, you got a 270-pound guy just throwing you around. You're gonna get beat up even if you submit him. You know, it's kind of like, uh, reminds you of like old Hoist when he was fighting uh, Chemo. It's kind of like one of those things, right? <laughs> so Micah ends up submitting him after like 24, 27 minutes, something ridiculous. So he had over like 42 minutes. I only had maybe a total of four minutes. So I was going against Micah in the finals and we gave him, gave him rest. And I said, hey, listen, whatever rest we need to talk, it was right there. This is all in one day. So it had to happen like one after another. There was no rest period like in wrestling. It's like, you know, the matches happen for a few minutes and go, if you need to go again, you have to go again. So I had Micah in the finals and um, we're going for, but I know Micah has got great endurance. He's got great technique. And I had to go try to shoot bullets and get, get him out fast. Just like they did before. And it wasn't working. And we're about five minutes in, six minutes in, seven minutes. In. And if the match goes down 10 minutes, he's going to have a huge advantage. because He's got great endurance. 
but he just went 40 minutes. So his endurance <laughs> was slow, right? And I was still fresh, but I'm trying to shoot these bullets, and I'm like, damn, this is this is not working. Because he's, his defense is good, and uh, Mike has always been really good. And I end up catching him in a footlock, which back then, but we did footlocks, but not not very many. You know, it, so it was considered gar- it was called considered garbage jujitsu. Uh, yeah, for for the jujitsu guys, for us it wasn't. For yeah. us it wasn't. We just chose not to do it. We liked it, you know, but we just chose not to do it uh, as much in training because in in the Nugialis we couldn't. I don't think they were legal at the time. So we're doing toe holds, foot locks, heel hooks. We're doing all that back in the day just because of our other martial arts experiences and and doing sambo and doing some other martial arts growing up, and then then Nelson showing us some good stuff, you know. And but we weren't practicing it for for months because we didn't know if it was going to be legal in uh in the Mundials in the uh, the World Championships. So I ended up uh, getting in, getting putting a knee on his stomach, reverse knee, and then got him a toe hold, and he tapped. And he was exhausted. I was exhausted because if I if that move didn't work, he probably would have he probably would have <laughs> run. That was it. <laughs> and as, as much as as much as he went forty, it would be, I mean, he went an hour, almost total an hour, and I went total. 15 minutes or so 14 minutes, right? And uh, but he had great endurance. Mike was a, a good athlete and a, a good bike rider. So he would uh he he had endurance, he could ride bikes like tour de fence style forever. So he had he built up a lot of a lot of endurance and we all knew that. So yeah, if you had good Mike, you gotta take him out pretty fast. Actually, all these guys. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, it'd be a long day. Like, I mean, look at Nelt, look at uh Sean and, and Ted. I mean, he wasn't gonna tap and they weren't gonna tap him, so he just kept going and so they just ran out of gas. And he finally got him, but he was exhausted, taking a beating from him, getting lifted and slammed. I mean, back in the day, we're slamming each other. There's no rules. I mean, there, if you got an arm bar, you put that guy on their head. You got a triangle, you're going to do the Ricardo Arona slam, you know, or, or Rampage Jackson. You, I mean, those are those are just, if you didn't want to get slammed, you just open your legs and didn't get slammed, but you lose the move. But there's no rules like it was now where there's all kinds of stuff you fall with somebody in your guard now you get disqualified you slammed them on their back there was none of that i mean every submission counted we were doing exequals like neck cranks foot locks hip locks all these things i mean we didn't do them very often because of the jiu-jitsu rules a little bit of the jiu-jitsu rules but on the mat there was no rules for us besides punching and eye gouging and fish hooking i mean it was like it was pretty brutal and uh yeah, yeah. Uh, no for that's, sure that's just a style that we grew up i mean uh, training just because we competed it wasn't like that in the classes it wasn't like that as much and in, in, but in team training yeah we grinded each other pretty good i mean somebody's bleeding pretty much every day uh but did, just from just from the roughness of it right did, did you train with some of the early lion's den guys as well yeah yeah i did like yeah, Bruno? I did uh oh uh, no actually i didn't train with them they they, they they came over and we were friends back in the day but we didn't okay. train together but after they left the Lions Den, a lot of them, a lot of them came over to my gym and they became uh, uh, part of my team. I told them, you know. But let me let me get back to the story with real quick. Yeah. Okay. Thing. We'll yeah, yeah, yeah. The sure. whole Lions thing, yeah. thing is a really cool story too. I want to get to that. Yeah. So, so I ended up winning the, the the tournament, and at the end of the tournament, we're all exhausted, we're sitting on the mat, and she talked to us like saying, "Okay, I want to." Because he liked the footlock, and he's always into intricate different submissions, like sambo and, and judo and just everything, wrestling, greco. He wanted to know who the best grappler was, and this is what we're doing at the time. No time limit, no points. And he said, I'm thinking about, I want to find out who the best grappler is. We're like, oh, the jiu-jitsu guys are the best, because we're all jiu-jitsu guys. So, well, how about the wrestlers? How about the sambo guys? How about this? We're like, yeah, you got a point there. I mean, the, and I said, it depends on the rule set. And so we sat on the mat for about an hour after the, the first tournament that we had in Abu Dhabi, uh, the, t- the team tournament. And he was asking questions. He probably already knew. He already had a vision of what he wanted. But he's asking us questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about, do they, do we have to wear a gi? I'm like, no, if it's going to be a grappling match. And this, we're all chiming in. We're all talking. We're all giving our points and point of views and and uh, and our two cents into it. And I think Tuck Dune, she, Tuck Dune already had an idea of what he wanted to do, but he wanted to run it past us and... And uh, we're just bouncing things off. And he said, he said, well, I don't want any points. And I said, well, if there's no points, how are you going to determine a winner? Because there's always going to be bias. Because we're used to jiu-jitsu tournaments where the, the Brazilians down here in Southern California are so biased. Across you know, the country. Across the country at that point. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, we're starting, we're starting 
We're starting fights at these jiu-jitsu tournaments, chasing the refs and, and chasing the promoters in the parking lot, going to kill them. These are cheating a, a seven-year-old kid, you know? I'm our kid. You know, I'm just like, dude, we're not going to have that. So we're like, talking to this guy, be points. Well, it's just hard to determine the winner. He's like, no, I got that point. But he's like, okay, well, how about, how about for the first half, there's no points so that so that nobody's trying to play the stalling game. Oh, you know what? He's like, okay, what points? What, what if they stall, like some of these jiu-jitsu guys back in the day? And it's like, he's like, well, how about the first half? We have no points. In the second half, we have points so that people can actually go after submissions. And the second half, they can go points so that it will be a winner at the end if, if nothing happens in the first five minutes. You know, I'm like, ah, that's a pretty good idea. He's like, well, how about how about uniforms? Right now, if it's gonna be, if it's gonna be a strictly grappling, we can't have uniforms because you saw Hoist using the gi later in the UFCs, or or even against uh, Kimo and Scott doing these equals. I mean, it could be a weapon. So some wrestlers or some Greco guys, they don't know what the gi is. You know, so I don't think there should be a gi. It's like, yeah, there should be a gi. You know, these are the jiu-jitsu guys and the judo guys will have an advantage being familiar with it. So he said, okay, no gi. Okay. And and he said, okay, no time limit. Okay. But then he said, okay, well, there has to be time limit because otherwise it's going to be so ridiculous. People will stall it out. And you're going to have matches an hour long, you know, 45 minutes an hour long at a time. You know, and if it's going to be a sport, it's really hard to train for that. So he's like, okay, well, what's the time? He's like, uh, he's like, okay, about 10 minutes should be good. And he's like, okay, he's, uh, and it's about what the, and then he's like, what about the points? And we're like, uh, it's got to be points because it's got to be a winner. He's like, okay, first half, no points, second half, points. And in the championship match, I want these guys to really go. So we'll do it. Twi- we'll do it twice as long. So we left it at that, and that's the that was the formation of the uh, the Abu Dhabi combat. Uh, uh, so it, it, this is obviously you know pre ADCC. That that was that was ADCC. Yeah, that became ADCC. That, that, that was conversation. A, yeah, that was wow. conversation creation of it at that point when we we're on the mat. So that was a creation of it. And I think uh, Talk to already had an idea about it, but he's running these things past us. And he experimented with our team for the ADCC with the no points, no time limit, and all submissions counted. And he experimented with that, and then he balanced the idea. So, we, like I said, we sit on the on, on the on the mat and have have a think like a think tank back and forth. And he wanted to know everybody's opinion. He was very welcome to hearing everybody asking these questions. And like I said, these probably questions he already knew. He he had in his in mind. He, he had a vision of what he wanted to do. He but wanted to push back. He wanted to push back. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the things we pushed back on and he said, okay, that makes sense. And and boom. And then there was there was no points for his first half, 10 minute matches, finals for 20 minutes. We established all that at that day on the mat after after that first tournament, the team tournament that we had. And then three years later, uh two and a half years later was the first Abu Dhabi combat. That's uh, that's insane. That's insane. Yeah. Nobody knows that. No, any, no anybody that knows that well the people that were sitting on the mat at that time. I mean, I've been told that I've told the story a few times here and there, but people don't know the people I tell, they don't know what I'm talking about. And the people that I that don't want to talk about, they're just like, oh, that, that's kind of weird. Like Abu Dhabi started like 98. <laughs> I'm like, no, dude, I was there in 95. <laughs> you know, we were all there in 95. You know, we're the first and, American. And, and then he got to see firsthand what a submission only tournament looks like with, you know, guys that he knew knew how to fight, you know? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so that's where the, the creation or the the seed was planted, and uh, we just refined it. She talked to him, refined it from then, and then he was asking about like just the different people. I'm like, hey, we got to get judo guys in there. We got to get wrestlers. These Greco guys from Russia, man, we got some monsters everywhere, and the jiu-jitsu guys, of course. But we need all these <sighs> Americans. So it was like this old, old, like remember Bloodsport with Jean Claude Van Damme, right? Where they send him this letter. And you go into the serious <laughs> place, and there's the Kumite, right? right? I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he saw that movie too. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. He was saying like all these names, and we researched all these names, and and uh, he started pulling these guys and and sending them no letters to this place called Abu Dhabi. We didn't even know where Abu Dhabi was. I mean, you have to look it up on the map back in the day. Yeah. And we we're like, it's here. We're like, okay, the what's going to happen? We didn't go yeah. there. I mean, like a, you're on a globe but, yeah spinning it <laughs> yeah we're like nobody could nobody knew where it was i mean we i mean we had guys some smart guys and and uh they didn't know where it was and uh, none of our friends or parents would knew they're like hey you guys are getting set up man they're gonna they're gonna take you out there and, and <laughs> take you on the desert and and you know you guys are gonna be slaves and i'm like well i don't know about this you know but we did some research we trusted everybody this is this is so long ago when we're teenagers you don't have any we didn't have anything to expect or we didn't have any having knowledge of what's going to be like. We didn't know what, 
much about it. We try to do this research, but there's no internet back then. So, I mean, we're doing research in yeah. books that were 20 years old. So back then, it was just sand. And your parents and are... 90s, your, your, yeah, your parents... Started becoming, yeah, it started becoming more of a city. And then every year since then, I've been back maybe four or five times since then. It's, it's just amazing, the growth of the, the place. Abu Dhabi and Dubai, it's just... It's insane. Oh, it's the same I, I, do. They've saved combat sports. But they've yeah. absolutely saved saved boxing. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, well. Uh, what I what I tell people all the time, like Top Noon, um, he had this tournament, and he did the first. I think he was a part of the first one GLs because if Nelson's involved with with uh, Carlos Gracie Jr., Top Noon had to be involved somehow. You know, because he well, we represented the Abu Dhabi team. So when we went down to Brazil, we were Team Abu Dhabi Seven. It's called us the Abu Dhabi Seven. People knew we were coming down because Nelson's a pretty big deal down in Baja Gracie. He's one of Carlos's guys that made it. He's the first guy in San Diego that made it. And, and everybody knew who Nelson was. And Henzo, of course, we trailed Henzo all the time. And all these other black belts came down. And, and uh, man, Nino and Holeta. And, and we had some amazing dudes back then. And I think the Holeta was, he was a bramble. He just got his black belt when we got down there. And uh, Nino was seven, 19 years old. He was winning. These guys were all fought in different, different pride events. And, and they're all kids, and we're we're younger than them. We're si- we're seventeen, eighteen, I think. And they're like they're they're the same age. And uh, <laughs> we just saw how the whole, how the whole thing how the whole thing progress. And having that happen was the first Gi World Championships. And then Takun does the she Takun does the the Abu Dhabi uh, Combat uh, Club, which which has a tournament. And I tell people all the time, if it wasn't for that tournament. MMA would be 10 years behind, maybe 15 years behind it would today. Because, because he allowed people, like the old blood sport thing, was giving them tickets to go to a foreign country. And everybody back in the day that had a martial arts studio, most of us had different jobs. I mean, just to, just to make rent. It wasn't, jiu-jitsu wasn't a big deal. Even down in Brazil, some guys were bouncers, some guys were bodyguards, some, and then they taught jiu-jitsu in their, in, in their studio. And it allowed them to go there, win or lose. They were there to trip and talk. Cheek Duck Noon and and his his brothers, they would always take care of the guys and give them money. Or, or if you had prizes, you'd win the prize. You're winning back in the night, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars, which is a lot of money for, for people. It's a lot of money it's now. Today. It's a lot of money today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Back in the day, can you imagine? I mean, you're living down in Brazil, you're selling hot dogs on the side of the beach and then teaching jiu jitsu just to make a living, you know? And and then you go there and, and you win ten grand, twenty grand, or even if you had a good showing, they would they would sponsor you and give you give you some money as a ticket on the side just for competing well. And you coming home now, you don't have to work that job. You can really concentrate on your craft. You can really concentrate on your students. You can really hone your teaching in, and you can teach and not worry about these bills for this until the next year comes back or or something else happens. And it gives you some breathing room and it really launched the sport to exponential levels. It was already going up from the UFC and just the combat sport uh, genre at the time. But then after the Abu Dhabi happened, boom, it launched it because it gave the, the instructors and the professors, they gave them a, a ability to to teach without being worried and, and really give into the students. Where those all those other students from Carlos Gracie Jr. And, and Carlson Gracie, they all went off. They all opened other schools. They all opened bigger things, took in more people, more students, more hobbyists, more fighters. And just develop their skill and pass it on, and it just went exponential after the Abu Dhabi tournament because of that. What they've done with combat sports, Abu Dhabi, mm-hmm. I mean the Middle East in general, they, they've they've allowed fights to happen that normally would be unattainable price wise. Yeah, they've you know incredibly grateful for for you know, their contributions. Um, Lions Den, um, yeah. With the Lions Den, when they closed, I mean, I know Ken constantly moved the gym. He uh, as good yep. of a fighter as he was. He had issues with business and handling his business agreements. Yep. Um, Steve Bruno, John Coperhaven, I heard those guys wound up over at your gym. Yep. Oh, uh, there was about five guys that came over. And uh, John War Machine, he, he, was, he came and trained with us, but he wasn't part of our team. He wanted to keep the Lions Den thing going because there's a lot of guys that came over. And um, a couple guys from Lions Den called me and said, hey, Ken, shut down. I think Ken called me too. And he said, hey, shut down. I got my young boys. He called me young boys. And uh, I'd like them to continue training, but there's no place in San Diego really to train. You're you're the place and we trust you. You know, I'm like, hey, Ken, you know, I'm I'm a jiu-jitsu guy. You know what I'm saying? You just fought Hoist 
And there's just that rivalry there, you know? I'm, you're putting me in a really tough position here if these guys come over. Because the real, already the Brazilian guys in San Diego, they didn't care for me that much because the way we did jiu-jitsu and the way that we taught and the way I had a school at San Diego Fight Club, it was that we did jiu-jitsu. We we're jiu-jitsu guys, but we did everything at the same time. And they were always teaching some people this and that, and and they didn't they didn't care for it. It wasn't traditional. So I I had a a um I, I wouldn't say a beat, but I was always looked down upon by 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 some of the Brazilian community, not by my instructor, not by not by the people that are close to us, but some other people. They're just saying like these guys, this guy's not pure jujitsu. You guys shouldn't be teaching. You know, I'm like, hey, no, we did pure jujitsu on the mat with the gi. We just did other things too that that you guys don't know how to do. It. Don't choose not to do. Don't 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 put that on me. You know, if you want to have a problem with it. I'll show up at your school. You show up at mine. I don't have a problem. It's an open door challenge, and we we help we help that challenge that we had too at the time. Like open door. If you want to come in? Let's go. Okay, we'll put something on it. But uh, but we had the reputation of doing that and having that, and 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 at the same time, I was friends with some of the Lansing guys. I never trained with them when when they're in, but I'd go down to the events. Uh, Ken had me be a, a judge at some of the the, the events that he had in the gym, and. And they were the first MMA gym in San Diego, first pure MMA gym. And we were the second, the San Diego Fight Club was the second MMA gym. There's gyms before us, like some boxing gyms that became uh, became MMA spots. But a lot of those gyms, I took them, jujitsu guys, I took them Dean or some other people, and then they created an MMA spot, but they were open before uh, the boxing place was open, boxing club or city boxing. These guys, these places were open before my gym, but they didn't have MMA there until either I brought them there or or I gave some contact numbers to get a hold of some jiu-jitsu guys to bring, bring MMA there. So we so we end up being the oldest fight club or MMA school in, in San Diego now, which is like a mecca of, of MMA. It's un unbelievable. All, over 120 schools here. Which everybody's talented. Everybody's got some good good stuff going on here. Just uh, just a wealth of knowledge of of uh, all different kinds of cell levels, but. Back to Lansden, uh, you shut him down. He said, "Hey, man, these I want these guys to go somewhere good, and I, I trust you. Can you take them on?" I'm like, "It puts me in a tough spot because if I take these guys on and they don't, and I don't make them commit to my school, they're I'm going to be labeled like a like a like a creolchi, which means like a backstabber, yeah, a traitor, yeah, like a jitsu hater." I'm like, "No, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I am." And so I made it real clear: these guys come over, like Eric Del Ferro. And see Bruno, uh, John, oh, uh, nine millimeter weight ship, and all these guys fought in the UFC, pretty much is really high end in shows in Japan. And uh, there's a couple other guys. I told them, hey, listen, if you come over here, you got to commit to me. You can't wear any of the lines and stuff. It, you know, n nothing bad against them. I have nothing against them, but you can't do that. You know, and when you represent, yeah. you have to represent us. You can't remember not, the there's no two club. schools. Yeah, there's no two schools in one building. It's one school, one building. Dude, smart move. Smart yeah, move. yeah. This is not a continuation of the lines. Then you guys are gonna learn something a lot different, and you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm gonna open your eyes to a lot of different things. I mean, Ken Harden, you guys, and he gave you a, a good base. And I mean, that's the tough part about fighting, getting somebody rough around the edges to that level. But the technique part, I'm gonna show you some stuff, some different stuff that's gonna enhance your game. And we're gonna, we're not gonna change your game. We're just gonna enhance whatever you guys have. And that was my theory with them. You know, I'm going to give them some different tools and then give them some different tools on, on how to carry this art on to the rest of your life too, as well. Okay. Because I told them like, and told these guys after they're done fighting, where are you going to be in five years, 10 years after you're done fighting? He's like, I don't know. Well, wouldn't you like to teach what you do? He's like, yeah, but, but how am I, how are you going to teach be tougher than somebody? How are you going to teach like lift more weights and run harder and punch them harder and get punched harder? You know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's value in that. But that's that's very hard to pass on, and that's what you guys have right now. Uh, you have some technique, don't get me wrong, but the technique is sporadic. There's no there's no curriculum to it. There's no uh, there's no path. It's just being good at certain things, and uh, and that's how they learned back in the day. That was very effective for fighting, but it wasn't very effective to pass on your art, you know, to your kids or to to your students or to even have students. And I think that's one of the main reasons why the Lions then Lions then went under. Besides some bit uh, bad business. And maybe Ken getting screwed over on some uh, some business deals. They had a huge facility. You got to pay for that, and you got to pay for that with the students and and a gym. And if you don't have a curriculum, we could teach consistently. It's really hard to keep a student if if they're coming in getting their ass kicked, or or they they, they look at the training and then they're like, I can't do shit. 
you know? True. Whoever was walking through that door was fresh meat. That's what it oh, was. 100%. It's just, it's and and, like, and that was, that's, it's a potential paying student. Not that this is it. <laughs> yeah, that's somebody going to. I mean, they might be me, but they got to pay the bills too. And they, right. and, and I hear stories like, man, and they, they really, they really molded and, and forged some really tough guys. Even guys that weren't even <laughs> on the team, they were pretty tough. They had a good mentality. It's like kind of like the old school wrestling grind, you know, like, I mean, I mean, you don't see a lot of football players, baseball players doing wrestling. I mean, some of them, yes, but it's a different environment. It's a different, different way of life. And uh, you can recognize it when you were that. And I can recognize that. Excuse me, even even not being a competitive wrestler, but but living in that environment for years, knowing that hey, that's the same environment Ken had. I like that. But man, it's a really tough way to run a business. And obviously, you know, yeah. 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 <laughs> what, what about Ken's brother, Robbie Kilpatrick? Did he ever make it his, his way over? He no, he never came over to, to uh to the fight club. No, just the guys I said, like Wade Ship, uh Steve Bruno, <laughs> okay, uh Brendan Tierney, uh Nine millimeter, he came over, but he worked out with us, but he wasn't part of our team. And then John, uh, War Machine, Copenhagen, he he came over too. He worked out with us, but he wasn't part of the team. So Ooh. that pretty strict line. Like, listen, you're part of and and, and Eric Del Fiero was with, with us too. Eric, Eric, Eric Del Fiero did a phenomenal job, phenomenal job afterward. Yeah. Yeah, he was there. So we had those guys that say, hey, listen, if you're not going to commit and wear these things, and, and you don't have to denounce the lines then. It's not about that. It's just like you can't cross the line and, and be a part of that right now when I have the jujitsu heat on my on my shoulders right now. And I mean my guys did whether they wanted to, but at the same time there's certain rules in my gym. And I'm like, hey, you're gonna have to do these things that I want. You know, you're gonna have to show up to practice, do these things, you're gonna have to commit. And and, and that wasn't a part of it, uh, the the big deal. It's just them, um, you know, representing certain brands or certain things that hey, I didn't want you to because hey, we as a team, we didn't represent that. Or we we didn't represent we had different sponsors that that we can't wear that. And it was just just little things like that, and I'm like, hey, and I'm not a, I'm not an easy coach to deal with too. I mean, I'm sure they're they're used to Ken, but I wasn't easy on that area too. A lot of guys that came over, they said, dude, they're scared of Ken. They're scared of Ken when when they're training him because he put them in in just really bad positions and made them get comfortable in bad positions and stuff. But but Eric take me aside. He's like, but they're frightened of you. They don't even want to. They don't even talk to you. And I felt like weird about it, you know, because. It was it was just hard training. We trained hard, but but uh, we didn't. I didn't train like Ken did. But it was like training. Be on time. You know, shut your mouth. Let's it was go. Structure. It was structured training. It, it was wasn't. Structured. Yeah. And, look, uh, and there was like, listen, if we knock each other up, pick each other up, give each other a hug, kiss on the cheek, and say, let's go. We still got time on the clock. You know, we're not going to stop the clock time. You get knocked out in the round. You're going to mess up somebody else's workout. You know what I'm saying? So when you wake up, we got to finish your round. We got rules. You get three rounds. You're finishing it. If you're knocked out or not, you got to wake up and finish your round. Or else, kick rocks. We don't need that kind of shit here. You know, so it may, may not have been the smartest thing to do, but that was our attitude, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and it was, so back, it was back in the day, bro. It is what it yeah, is. They didn't, yeah, they didn't, they didn't shy away from that, but it was the structure. It was somewhat the structure at the time, and uh, I wanted to make sure that they represented the Fight Club, and, and uh, they didn't have any side issues with that, and and anything else and not because we're against line it's just because uh, you know like you said it's one school like i said it's one school you represent the team that you're on you can't can't play for the chargers and go train with the uh the raiders you know it just doesn't work that way no yeah. you uh john coperhaven war machine what was yeah. like your recollection of him i like john john was great he was like a loose cannon right but when when these guys came over to my gym they were they were on point they're like soldiers Okay. He was one of the youngest guys, but he was on point. He he was like pretty much no sir, yes sir. And and he was like, you know, had fun and wanted want to train hard, but but there's always so much strategy involved. You know, I, I cornered him for a lot of fights, uh, threw down to Mexico. And and he was he was he's on point. I think where he, where John uh lost it a little bit was when he after after the fight club and we moved and he and, and undisputed opened up there's a couple places where he opened up and just being a fighter you you're you're exposed to a lot of different temptations a lot of different people and people put you on a pedestal and and we have this newfound because none of us did it for fame none of us did it for money because there was none of that back in the day there's no fame there's no money you know we did it because our ego and we did it because 
I don't like the other guy that I'm going to fight pretty much, you know, and, and, and we weren't trying to submit people. We're trying to hurt people. And that's just how the fight game was, you know? And, and when, when the whole industry went through the roof and John's part of a uh, big, a lot, a lot of, a uh, lot of students and a lot of fans come by, I think it, it got to a point where, man, his personality shined in a way where it was being fueled by, by all these little temptations left and right. But when, whenever that was happening, he'd come back to the fight club and train every once in a while or, or hang out. And he was always, yes, sir, no, sir. Like, or, you know, just like, hey, hey, what's up, Charlie? Like, really cool, really mellow. I'm like, hey, what's going on with your life? He's like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm fucking up. I'm doing this and that. And and I'm like, why? He's like, well, you know, and I'm see seeing the guys, the, the little groupies that are around him. And I'm like, man, it doesn't help to be around these guys pushing you to do stuff. Or not not necessarily pushing you, but but they're expecting you to do something if if something happens, like you're handling it in the streets, you know, and, and I grew up with the same mentality, uh, same thing too, but you got to pick and choose why you're fighting and, and what's happening and why you're doing these actions. And we've all messed up. Don't get me wrong. We've all messed up, but man, consistently in that environment where you're up on a pedestal and you can't do anything wrong, even if you do do something wrong, they'll, some people cover it or, or justify it. And you'll, you'll lie to yourself about what happened or that guy deserves it. Yeah, but times change. You can't do those things anymore. You know, you just can't beat the shit out of people on the street. I mean, believe me, I, we've done our share of stuff, but even now, we can't. You can't just go around. You can't even can't even call somebody a name these days without getting busted. You got to be adapt to the environment. And uh, when you're around a bunch of knuckleheads, that's really easy to get off track. You know. Yeah, I mean, you are who you hang we're out with. Knuckleheads too, but we uh, we we just did it a little smarter, or we didn't get caught. <laughs> and then we got older, so we grew out of it a little bit. So, but, but when you're young and, and you got the internet just happened and, and all the social media just happened at that time, man, it gets, it gets really easy to, to get away from it. And once you do going down that path, it's a dark road because it's, it's, uh, it just could get really violent and it's going to turn around on you sooner or later. You also worked out with Gerald Strebent. Yeah, Gerald. Yeah, stud. He, uh, he was going to fight in one of Eric's events, uh, Eric uh, DeFerro's event, he, Eric had a total combat. And remember the, back in the day, there's this thing called the Underground, the Forum. Hey, right? it's, it's, still, we, it's still there. <laughs> it's still there. And yeah. I remember coming home from training and getting on that. It was, it was That was the best TV show ever. It was it was basically just a forum on, on the internet. It, it rarely had pictures or, or videos on there because it was real hard to upload things, right? So you'd be talking to people, you'd not know who you're talking to. And people, there'd be trolls on there, some keyboard warriors, and then some all the real fighters were there too. So we'd be talking and then um, we just chatted times. And and Gerald trained with, with Eddie Bravo. I think he was one of Eddie Bravo's better guys at the time. He was one of the guys that helped invent the rubber guard. Yeah, so he came down yeah. and I said, I said, we come down. He's all, he's all coming to San Diego to, to fight in Eric's event. Oh, uh, to do a grappling match in Eric's event. It was down in Mexico. So, so he's like, well, I don't have a place to stay. I'm like, hey, man, I don't know you, but come stay with me, bro. We chat on the, uh, online a few times. <laughs> and you're one of Eddie's guys. Eddie used to announce some of my fights. I'm friends with Eddie. I know Eddie from back in the day. You know, Eddie's always been always been solid, you know, always been a good guy. And I'm like, if you're anything like him, like, hey, dude, you're welcome, you know. So he comes down, and, and man, he just came down, and I think it was a brown belt at the time. And... And he was just so, he just asked me questions left and right, all these things, just, you ah, want to know this, want to know that, want to know this, this, like, hey, can we go to the, can we go to the gym and train? I want to see the fight club. I'm like, bro, it's like, it's like three o'clock in the morning right now. We're just staying up talking, right? I'm like, it's three o'clock in the morning. Man, you got, you got a match coming up in, in, in the next two days here. We just got down the weigh-ins. I've been drinking. I wasn't fighting. I was coaching, but, you know, after the weigh-ins, you know, everybody eats who are drinking. And I'm like, no, man, he just kept asking, asking me. So it's like three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, okay, fine. All right, bro, dude, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the, I'll give you the privilege. Let's go. He's like, yo, I just want to roll. Get out there. It's like one of the coolest nights in San Diego. My mat was like rock hard. And I've been on that, you know, I've had the gym for, for many years then, but it's probably the coldest night I've ever been there. And he's like, let's roll, let's train. He's like, I just want to see if my like, God, I want to show you this stuff that Eddie's, Eddie's doing, this rubber guard stuff. I'm like, Okay, I heard about it. I heard it's pretty good stuff. And he's showing me some things. And I'm like, wow, well, this is this is this is pretty good stuff. You know, I mean, oh, and then he's like, Can we roll? And I'm like, sure, we can roll. You know, he's showing me these things, and he was catching me in a couple different 
different uh, positions. And I'm like, if I wasn't, if I wasn't aware of it, or if I wasn't a good athlete, if I wasn't bigger and stronger than him, it would be like, oh, I'd, I would be, I'd, I would be in trouble to get out of it. So I had a lot of respect for for Eddie Bravo's the rubber guard and all that stuff back in the day. This is back, shoot, wow, I don't know, early two thousands, maybe late nineties. I don't, uh, it was it was around that time. Uh, probably probably early two thousands. And he showed me all these cool things, all these technical stuff with, uh, with the rubber guard and or just different wait, positions with arm bars. And it was very wait, cool. wait, was it was this pre two thousand the ADCC where Eddie submitted uh, Hoyler? I think that it oh, it was two thousand three is where he submitted Hoyler. So was yeah, this it was, pre, it was, it was, was this pre Hoyler? Yeah, I think it was pre pre. So, pre I'm gonna tell you, man, hmm. you're always ahead. Like you're always ahead. <laughs> That's what happens when you're older, brother. <laughs> That's right. So were you as receptive to the rubber guard, or did you kind of resist like you did jujitsu initially? No, I did jujitsu. No, when I when I roll with them, I'm doing jujitsu. I'm doing like hard nose jujitsu with pressure right. stuff. Same but thing. initially I'm, I'm, you had you had pushback against jujitsu. Uh no, against rubber guard. No, I didn't know anything. I didn't know too much about it. I saw it and I'm like, okay. oh, it's pretty cool stuff. Eddie's doing it, it must be okay. You know, okay. so I didn't know if it was, okay. was a teaching style or a fighting style. So Joe came down, started showing some stuff. I'm like, this is pretty good shit, like really tactical stuff on on how to take an arm bar from some, certain positions. Not even the rubber guard itself, but but elements with within uh, different positions, right? And then and then we start rolling, and then he and he he didn't show me the rubber guard as much until we start rolling, and then he's catching me on some lockdowns and some other stuff. I'm like, okay, and then he's trapping some arms, and then. I'm watching him do these things to me because I'm kind of like between being intricate. Yeah. But if you let it get too far, you're in, you know, you're in big, big trouble, right? So I'm doing it. I'm like, okay, it's time to get out. Boom, boom, I'd get out of stuff. But if I wasn't strong and athletic, and I let it get too far, well, it was there was going to be trouble. And we're about the same size at the time, but I was a little bit more a senior. And Gerald, you know, and Gerald was good. He showed me some stuff. But he's fluid. So he was getting ready for a fight against uh, Matt Serra. And 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 UFC, and he invited me. Hey, he he hit me up. He's like, "What do you think I should do?" I'm like, "I should. I don't think you should take the fight." And this was years after after he came down, and uh, we rolled, you know. And he's like, "Why?" Because I'm like, "Well, unless I mean, well, I don't know your training, but you're telling me stuff on the phone. You're telling me stuff what you're what you're concerned about." And Matt, Sarah, and in my style, we're probably very similar. We're shorter guys. We're tack. You know, Matt Sarah is, is a friend of, I mean, he was under Henzo and Henzo and, and Sean Alvarez were friends. So I'm calling Sean and uh, I'm like, hey, how Matt, how's Matt doing? He's like, oh, dude, he's an animal. I'm like, okay, okay. Well, I'm going to go work with Joe a little bit and uh, and we'll go from there. So I go up to Hollywood to Eddie's place. And at that time, uh, we I came up there and Gerald, he didn't have any, at the time, I don't think he had any training partners specifically for like Matt Sarah for his style. So I went in there and it was ugly. It was bad. I mean, I was taking him down, slamming. I'm like, Matt's gonna do the same thing to you, bro. I'm like, you're just gonna do this, this, and this. He's gonna get you down, and he's not gonna give you a chance to put the rubber guard on. He's gonna just hit angles or or smash you against a cage or, or whatever he's got to, you know. I mean, you can't play this jujitsu game with him. You gotta be able to mix it up. So we're going with takedowns and punches and all the stuff he knew, but I was very aggressive and and very very hard nose kind of telling him like listen this is how it's going to be man you got to fight in like three or four weeks this is how it's going to be you need to step up your training this is bullshit that you, you don't even know how to defend this right now and i was getting pissed because i like the kid i want him to do well even though he's going against like a uh, cousin school of ours and, and henzo's you know i want him to at least have a good showing and uh that's when uh, i think carl carl and dan henderson showed up he said called dan and said i'm going to be training up at uh at um at uh, eddie bravo's place and then Carl just happened to be in at that time too. So he trained. They weren't training with us. They're training by themselves off to the side. But I was working with Gerald, me and him, and, and a couple other guys. And we're just going at it. And and after after that, he we go to dinner and he just said, and I think he hurt his knee. He hurt his knee or something during the training towards the end. And uh, I think he tore it, uh, MCL or something. And it wasn't wasn't really bad, but he was limping. I remember him at dinner. He started limping when he cooled off. I'm like, hey, what's up with your legs? Oh, I think I hurt it a little bit. And I'm like, he's like, what do you think about the fight? I'm like, that's going to be a tough ass fight for you compared to what we just did. And then he got his knee checked out and he ended up tearing it. I'm like, well, that's a blessing, bro, because I don't know how it would have turned out, but putting the training like three weeks out, uh, I don't think you were, you were ready for that kind of match, you know? I would say Matt Sarah, if you actually look at his abilities and the timeline of them, 
he may have been one of the most well-rounded martial artists at, at, at one point in his career, you know, in the sure. entire world. He really sure. was. He was very, very special. Yeah, he's, he's a great student, too. I mean, I mean, he, he knows the game. He knows how to teach it. And, and look at the students he's produced. And that just shows how good he was and how knowledgeable, because he's producing guys from Henzo's that are just animals. And they're doing, they're doing well. I mean, even now they're doing well. So I heard a lot of good stories from that. And when Sean would train with them, he said, dude, there's a guy here. When he was, I think Matt was like a blue approval belt. He said, there's a guy here that reminds me of you, Charlie. Because, yeah, me and Sean, you know, we spend time here in San Diego, but also back in Abu Dhabi. So there's a guy here, Matt Stratton, man, he's tough. I'm like, oh, yeah, let me, I, I want to I know more about this guy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's on the East Coast, <laughs> on the West Coast. I'm like, maybe we could, we could meet up someday. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's, he's got guys, he's got yeah, he's, he's got like, Biggie. I got Pac. You know, let's do it. Let's go. Let's go. You know, and me and Sean would always battle. He's like, oh, East Coast, this and that. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about, man? We're West Coast. We're San Diego. You lived here too, you traitor. What are you talking about? But he's originally from New York, so he always defended. He actually defended Biggie, and we had that we had the argument against West Coast. We just arrived and everything, but it was always fighting. These were like brothers, right? Yeah. But yeah. people say, getting that sad, man. He's coming after you. He's pretty tough. I'm like, let's go. What's he at? You know, so, but. I just wanted to meet him. I always followed him and, and wished him the best because he was doing some amazing stuff. And dude, being another short guy like myself, I'm like, this this is it, man. He comes from the, the cousin school of ours and he trains with you know with Henzo and, and Nelson and uh, you know, and Henzo and Nelson were like best friends back in the day and and, and from Baja Gracie and then Sean's training with them and John Rollo over there and, and, and the East Coast is training with them. He's like yeah, this guy's legit. I'm like, hey, that's awesome, man. Good for him. Being short, I'm like, dude, I always wanted him to win having having one up for the short guys. You know? <laughs> yeah, dude, I, I'm, I do that with the ball guys. You know what I mean? Right. Like, we don't look out for yeah, each I'm other. Too, hey, we don't look too. out for each other. No one will. You know what I mean? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Let me throw a couple more names at you. Um, Reggie Cardiel. Yeah, Reggie. Yeah, Reggie was a, was a good friend of mine. He, uh, he was, uh, I met him. Up at uh, right before the some of the Cobra challenges, I would go up to Mark Hall's gym and uh, train with the guys. It was uh, or up in Canada area, up in San Diego, and then we keep going north, and then we go to Temecula and train at Mark Hall's gym, and uh, just get a good day of training, get a good little little different variety of people. And he was I think Mark Hall's best best student friend at the time, right? And uh, Reggie was fast, fast hands kickboxer but then he learned learned a uh, submission grappling he didn't learn too much uh bits and pieces of jiu-jitsu but mark hall there there back in the day there was there was very few few jiu-jitsu places even even up north a little bit you know i mean you had a handful in la and there was probably under at that time under seven or eight in san diego you know and and uh so when we went up there to camp Pendleton, train some of the marine guys that that had their uh combat stuff um it wasn't the Marines coming. It's just a bunch of bunch of guys that that were that were into M uh, no holds part at the time that did jujitsu wrestling, but they didn't have any jujitsu. We'd go up there and we'd roll these guys, and they're just like, "Oh my god, this is this is ridiculous." I'm like, "Yeah, this is we've been trained for years, so so it's a big big gap in level uh, difference." And then and then we went up and trained with Reggie. Those guys they had they had some submission grappling, but there wasn't sequences like jujitsu, and so he had moves, just kind of like the Lansing guys. They had moves they could get out of. And they had moves that they like to do, you know. And then the better guys had transitions, but it was still, still kind of um, figuring it out. Everyone's figuring it out. Yeah, yeah, they're figuring yeah. it out. There's still gaps in the transitions in the game, and those guys just punch harder and were faster standing uh, to make up the the differences and try to fight the game that way. But back in the day, there was no stand ups. You know, there's no pretty much if you go to the ground. And and some of the time limits were were longer than five minutes. So if you go to the ground once and you don't know what you're doing, the fight's over. You know, and uh, they weren't stopping the fights for cuts or anything. So if you're getting pounded, it's over. So in a fight nowadays, you have to take somebody down 10 times to beat them on the ground. Every round starts on your feet. Every cut, you're usually going to start standing. Doctors are going to stop the fights. You're going to end up starting standing again. Very rarely you go back to the same positions. If there's some kind of a, some kind of glove problem, you, you know, you end up start standing. There's an illegal move. You get knee in the head or something weird that there was no rules back in the day. You're going to start standing again. They're going to put you on the ground. So you have to take some. If you're a wrestler, you got to take somebody down a good five to ten times to, to win the fight nowadays. Back in the day, you take somebody down one or twice, once or twice. Shit, it's over if, if they didn't know what they're doing on the ground. So it was a big advantage to be a jiu-jitsu guy and a wrestler. 
uh, back in the day. And then strikers were kind of figuring it out, but they, but they tried to make it up for striking, which wasn't worth that much back in the early UFC days. I mean, you saw what happened. I mean, up until recently, striking. I mean, it was it was it was jujitsu guys. There was the wrestlers. There was the strikers. There was the jujitsu guys. It's gonna it's gonna do the cycle every about six to seven years. And right now it's the strikers, and you see everybody's a kickboxer. But don't don't get it wrong. Every all those guys know how to wrestle. All those guys know how to do jujitsu as well. But uh, but back in the day, it was, it, it was you had your you had your strengths. And and there was a big gap. Nowadays, there's a lot of cookie cutter MMA guys. They're 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 decent at everything, but they're not great at anything. You know, yeah. yeah. You see the great guys just pick them apart, like the great kickboxers or the or the great jujitsu guys, like you know Damian Maya, or you see you know like uh, Asanya and these guys. You know, they're yeah. great at their, their individual sports, but they know everything else. Or Chuck Liddell, you know, Chuck wasn't even a, he was a wrestler, you know, and you didn't see too much of his wrestling because it made him so confident in a, in a striking. You know, so so people were good. The Chuck was good at a couple of things. He just didn't have a chance to to show too much of it on the ground. He's knocking everybody out. But but there's a lot of guys that had their specialties back in the day, and and uh, and one of the specialties that most people did not have was jujitsu. <laughs> I mean, they knew how to grapple, but there was and they knew submissions, but they didn't know the transitions and how to get in and out of them as well without without expending too much energy and wasn't they weren't being efficient. And you know you could you could be stronger, better athlete than somebody. And you get out of a triangle five times and just slam the guy down the ground, but on the fifth and sixth time you get a little tired. You're gonna get submitted unless you know how to get out with the uh, the right way with efficiency. And Reggie was one of those guys. And I think Mark shut his school down, and Reggie called me up. Says I went up there a few times, and uh, and we fought on the same card uh, two three times. And Reggie called me up. He says I'm thinking about moving out to San Diego, man. I want to come train with you. And I'm like, listen, I'm going to give you the same speech I did to the Lansden guys, too. Like, if you're with me, you're with me. You know, that's it. Okay, you, you're not you're not playing for Mark Hall or you're not coming in as a nomad and just, you know, training when you want to and coming off. You know, you're part, part of the team. You got to be able to contribute, you know. And everybody that comes in, and he was all game for it. No no problem, you know. And I'm like, but you're with it, you're with it. And he was a big part of it. Every All our guys that, that were uh, the younger guys in the gym, they called him Uncle Reggie. Because he's a little bit older, and uh, Reggie was such a good guy. He's too generous. And uh, me and him, we both kind of grew up in different scenes, but came together with the MMA. But same thing with poker as well. He was a professional poker player, and I played for a long time. We kind of run hand in hand, and we run each other in, in different tournaments and, and, and fight events, but different poker tournaments as well. And so he was, So when you play poker, you always have exposable cash because it's just, it's just a lot of money floating around, okay, even online or, or cash shipping. Because you're going to either spend it or lose it. You might as well just, then you always have it to to be able to play play a tournament or play a big big stakes game. I mean, you're always carrying around thousands of dollars because if a game pops up, you want to be able to jump in your car and go. Because it's pretty rare to have a big game, big home game back in the day, like real poker games. Like we're not talking like a home poker game with your buddies and drinking beer. We're talking like, all right, we're talking, you know, 50 to 100 grand on, uh, back in the day on the table at one time. And you don't know if you can get robbed on the way out. You know, you just got to be really careful. But, uh, but he was always generous, and he always took care of a lot of things for the guys. And all the guys, all the guys, really the college guys, and young young wrestlers, young, young fighters, and we didn't have much. So me and Reggie would help take care of stuff. We'd go out, and some of these guys, yeah, they're trying to fight. They didn't even have a, they couldn't even eat dinner, you know, or a proper dinner, you know, or they didn't have the right nutrition or, or the right stuff, and. He would always help out and 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 uh, you know treat to dinner or, or we'd go to team events and he'd always handle stuff and and it, it rubbed off on me where I where we had these fighters come in and and uh, we we'd help them out a lot because you know fighting we don't make anything and we we try to take ten percent off the purses but when they're making nothing ten percent I felt bad I just yeah can't. so I would give it to them and I would spend money so every time my guys fought for ten years it cost me I did I did a breakdown it cost me five or six hundred bucks to get them to fight. And we weren't winning anything from it, you know. They would they'd win like five, six hundred bucks, maybe a thousand dollars. But what am I going to take a hundred, hundred dollars off a thousand? That kid needs it more than I do. Yeah, you know? he can't. Be out of pocket. Cost Reggie out of pocket for a lot of stuff like sponsorship stuff on the on the pads. It wasn't easy back in the day. You had to get it embroidered. That would cost like a hundred bucks just to get one sponsor on there. And the sponsor would probably give you fifty bucks. So we're we're spending more money putting him on the shorts than than actually what they're giving us. So it was it was, it was one of those things. Um, and then weighing in and learning how to do stuff. He helped out a lot besides that. But he was a good fighter. He was a good fighter. He helped out the team a lot. He's a total team player. And uh, 
Yeah, sadly, he he got a weird weird cancer and he passed away. Uh, a good shoot, maybe eight years ago, so a while back. And uh, yeah, we missed him a lot. Uh, I I see uh, see pictures of him on online, and and uh, a lot of guys they still thank him for for a lot of things that he did for being Uncle Reggie for the Fight Club. Yeah. He, you know, uh, in part of my research for you mentioned the Underground Forum, it's, ladies and gentlemen, it is still up and running the most jaded, <laughs> mentally disturbing human beings with their trolling. It still happens there. And uh, Wrecker, when you go through the old comments, you, you know, Reggie Cardiel was known as Wrecker. Um, yeah. He was on there quite a bit and his memory is, uh, it's still there. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, the, the the shit talking back and forth, and the trolls, and and people not knowing who they're talking to sometimes. And <laughs> right, oh, you're Chris Brennan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it, it was it was entertaining. I remember teaching and getting home late, and I would I'd go right past the TV. I'd go right past dinner at, at nine nine or ten at night, and go right to the computer and and just see what's going on on the forum because it's just comedy. The the, the one liners and the shit talking back and forth. It was just pure comedy. I mean, it was it was just words. I mean, you got to it was there's rarely pictures when I was on it. There's I mean, if you put a video up, you're a genius because it was so hard to, to post anything yeah. on that. Thing. Yeah. But, yeah. but it was, it was such comedy. It was great. Uh, that's how we got the information. That's how we knew who people were. And we heard names like uh, Forrest Griffin back in the day, back in like the 90s. Way back there, hey, there's a kid back in the Midwest. He's coming up. He's in his fourth group. I'm like, okay, cool. That's because we find out all this information and we, you know, you fair fight with other fighters. You you email them or talk to them. Like, oh, yeah, he's legit. And so we knew, like, who who was good and, who, you know, and um, some guys up north, too. There's a lot of guys in the Washington area. And just we we, we became uh, came acquaintances by a lot of different names and knowing who these guys were without even seeing the pictures of them. So yeah. it was real. It was Anthony, really the yeah, yeah, Anthony Smith. Uh, I mean, obviously, current day UFC star. He was on there quite a bit. Actually, made his name for himself. Um, yeah, no, it's it's dude. It's still pretty amazing place. I, I suggest cool. you go take, take a peek back there. All right, so Charlie, he, here here's the thing. I have done a shitload of research <laughs> on you, right? And I've really only gotten past three questions. Yeah. <laughs> So what we're going to do, if it's okay, like we, this is like a history. Like what you just did was you just gave us a, a 101 and some incredible history. I am going to take this, make it a standalone, and let's give it a few months. If you're comfortable, I'd like to go over your career with you because it's pretty interesting. Like your career alone has got some, I mean, dude, you, you fought Shaolin. I mean, your match with with Rob Roy, our uh, – or Sharon Leggett, you took the fight a week out against somebody else because Rich Crunkleton lost two opponents. You agreed to it. Crunkleton's your opponent. You show up, and now it's a different yeah. guy. Yeah. We, had, we had actually uh, like three three fight changes. I was supposed to yeah. fight Rob McCullough. Yeah. For the time, yeah. Right? Jimmy Carter. Yeah. And then that didn't work out. So then we yeah. got somebody else, and that didn't work out. And then two days before, they had Sean Leggett. I'm like, okay, whatever. I was always game to fight anybody. The problem with that fight is I just fought ten days before that, and I busted yeah. my. I, I I I was coming into the fight injured, but I'm like, hey, you know, fuck it, let's go. I mean, let's go. It's just more fighters. Yeah. I mean, that guy slapped me in the streets. I'm not gonna say, hey, hold on, let me warm up a little bit. I'm gonna hit him back. So I came in with an attitude, and uh, yeah, it just didn't work out for me. But yeah, we had like three, three, four uh, fights. And, and, and then like your your run with King of the Cage, WFA, John Lewis. Like there's in terms yeah. of historical importance and like your fingers being you know in it there is a lot left uh -huh. if you wouldn't mind if we could revisit a conversation in a few months i know my buddy joy venti who was in fred hammer both of my buddies they were at wet and wild and they're like wait a minute dude he's on the wet and wild you uh -huh. know and they actually stayed there until the you know through the main event you know so they were one yeah. of like 50 people outside of staff so right. I, i'd really like to kind of revisit a conversation with sure. you career oriented you know obviously some other questions in regards to history but dude this this has been a phenomenal little lesson uh in regards to adcc lion's den eddie bravo man i i greatly greatly appreciate your knowledge man well thank you brother thanks for the opportunity and i uh, appreciate appreciate all, all the stuff that you do too man yeah. history, history of man is this so much i mean man people don't know these stories and there's probably a lot of them out there and and uh, something like you doing the research and, and asking the, asking these questions and uh, giving guys 
guys the opportunity to really tell the the true story of the MMA, how 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 it happened uh, from the beginning here uh, in San Diego, at least, you know. Oh, for sure. Well, I mean, dude, you're Garrick Landis, Betis Mansouri, like Christian Vargas, your issue yeah. with Manny Reyes. I mean, there's a lot going on yeah. with you. Right on, brother. You know, all right kick on. ass right stuff. On. 100%. Dude, you're the man. I sincerely appreciate Tim Ford. I got to send him another little thank you package. Greatly appreciate it, man. Thank you, right, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, bud. Talk soon. Bye -bye. Well, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you this right now. We have got 65 people that have rated us and left reviews on iTunes. We are not going to get pushed to anybody else, like your friends, family members, or buddies that might be into this they're never going to hear about us until we break that about 150 mark so like if you enjoyed this and you like this podcast we've done a ton of research a lot of love into it giving the people our guests every single one of our guests we've given the same amount of love and respect as we did with them as we we did with with uh, charlie so if you guys can leave us a review man it's a super super solid thing if you guys want to interact with us YouTube comments in the underground form, mixedmartialarts.com. Go to MMA.tv or mixedmartialarts.com. Look for the underground forum. Some of the most jaded individuals, corner men of big fights, people that like understood the inner workings and maybe were on commissions in the in the late 90s. There, some of them are still on there, and the information that that they put forth is truly incredible. It's one of my favorite places just to hang out. So if you guys like this, like, share, subscribe, greatly appreciated. This guy's coming back in a few months. I promise you. I know it's like sometimes we, we make that promise with other fighters. I, I've got other people wanting to sit in on this with him so we can go through his career at a later date. So thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you guys. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.